On this episode of the New Money Habits podcast, we sit down with a very special guest, Catherine Vanderland of SaverStreet.com. What's up, budgeteers, and welcome to the New Money Habits podcast. I'm your host and one of the co-founders of New Money Habits, Coach Nino Villa. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming a very special guest to the New Money Habits podcast. Catherine Vanderland is not only a Christian financial and executive coach, but she is also the creative mind behind the Innovative Outreach in a Box program, a unique initiative designed to help churches spread financial literacy within their communities. Catherine's passion for empowering others through biblical financial principles is changing lives, and we're thrilled to have her on to share her wisdom on achieving financial abundance. If you have any questions, be sure to hit us up on social at New Money Habits and follow us on your favorite podcast platform or tell your smart speaker to play the latest episode of the New Money Habits podcast. If you want to help out the show, consider leaving a five-star rating and review. We cannot thank you enough for leaving those five-star ratings and reviews. They truly help us spread this message of hope to people looking for a better plan for their money. Now let's get into today's episode. All right, Catherine, very excited to have you with us. For those who don't know Catherine, she is a Christian financial and executive coach at SaverStreet.com. She focuses on getting into practical, actionable steps so her clients can simplify their lives and live authentically at home and at work. Catherine loves Jesus, loves being with her husband and two kids, and loves helping people transform their lives. So again, Catherine, so happy to have you with us today. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your story? Thank you, Nino. I, I'm very excited to be here. Oh, that is such a broad question. Tell me about your story. Uh, I, I think my story mimics a lot of different stories. I, I got out of college. I went to the workforce. I found myself in a career I loved the career for the most part, and then I didn't love my career. I went through rounds and rounds of layoffs with survivor guilt and realized I wanted to start my own company. I was, I was kind of done with living with the uncertainty of, well, am I going to keep my job? Mm. And so I started a company, COVID hit right after I started the company two months later, and, uh, and it was like, I know it was an awful thing that happened, um, and continues to happen. Uh, but it actually helped save about two hours a day on my commute because my whole job said, Hey, work from home. So mm -hmm. I had two extra hours to start this company to reach out. And a lot of people were freaking out about their finances. So that's how Saber Street was born. Okay. And so... <laughs> How did you get started in financial literacy specifically and what drives your passion for that work? What a great question. I started in financial literacy a long time before I started Saber Street. So I love people, absolutely love people. I like getting into deep conversations and my team at work and my friends at church realized that I really did truly care about them. So when we got into these deep conversations, I would ask, hey, you said you're okay, but you don't look okay. What's going on? And a lot of times they'd tell me about their finances. Hey, I'm trying to pay off some credit cards. I don't know what to do with investing for retirement. I am not sure how to manage my daily spending. I think I'm spending too much. We'd get into it. We would get deep into behavioral spending. We'd get deep into financial decisions. It was a very natural transition. I ended up also becoming the go-to person at my companies, both companies, for uh, selecting benefits, the non-HR person for benefits, because I would create this giant spreadsheet. It actually wasn't that big. And, <laughs> uh, and help people evaluate their decisions, their health insurance decisions. I still do it every year for my clients. <laughs> And so obviously this has just been a long time coming. Saver Street was was a long time coming. Definitely it was. I I thought about starting a company for 
maybe four or five years before I started Saver Street, but I couldn't put my finger on what to do. Mm. And a friend of mine at church said, hey, have you heard of a thing called financial coaching? I think you're already doing it. You should look into it. <laughs> yep. I didn't. Yeah. So that's that's how it happened. I looked into it and went, yeah, oh, yeah, I am doing that. Maybe I should get some training and figure out what I'm doing wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so you've taken this passion of yours and you've put some real structure around it. Um, obviously, offline, you and I have talked a little bit and you have a outreach program, a a program that focuses on uh, financial abundance. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that program? And then we're going to define what you mean by financial abundance, because I'm very interested. Yeah, it I, I love having structure to things. Absolutely love it. Um, so at one point, I realized that I was coaching individuals who have who had a lot of money. They were bringing in about the same that I was. I was in the top 5% of incomes in the United States. The, that was my population of friends and network, right? Hmm. So I was coaching people who had, who were making $150,000, $200,000, $250,000 a year and, and more. And now, I, I mean, my highest grossing client makes about $1.5 million a year, hmm. right? But it, it wasn't, it didn't seem like enough right? It didn't seem like I was helping enough. So I put together a course called Financial Abundance that is positioned, that operates as an outreach activity for churches. So it's free for, for churches to put on, and the only cost for attendees is the workbook. And if the church is doing any sort of like lunch, then you have to pay for lunch, depending on the church. Hmm. So it, it creates this structure that is a financial literacy introduction for folks, but it also gets super deep into what are your values? How do you align those values with your financial decisions? What are your beliefs and your behaviors? Because your beliefs influence your behavior. So it goes really, really deep in a very short time. Hmm. I've gotten really great feedback about it. <laughs> <laughs> Hence why I would love for you to talk some more about it. Um, but at the same time, so first of all, it's titled Financial Abundance. And anybody who's been listening to the New Money Habits podcast for a while uh, may be familiar with the way I like to define abundance, but I would love to hear why that title and how do you define financial abundance? Ah, uh, Yes. Financial abundance does not mean what you think it means. Find a lot of people hear financial abundance and they think, ah, oh, I'm going to have, I'm going to have infinite money. That's <laughs> not it, right? Uh, financial abundance is all about personal responsibility, giving, and value based spending. I should say that again. Financial abundance is all around taking personal responsibility for your decisions, aligning your spending with your values so that you feel abundance in your life, and giving because that creates abundance around you. That's what financial abundance truly is and why it's called financial abundance. I've gone into a lot of different churches. They hear financial abundance and they go, oh my goodness, are you, are you about to tell me all about the prosperity gospel. And I promise you that is not it. That is not it. I'm not saying yeah. that God is going to just rain money down out of the heavens. Uh, if you follow this, that's, please don't hear what I'm not saying. So that's, yes. that's not it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And to clarify, just even a step further, as, as listeners have heard on the podcast before, right? Abundance. When Jesus said he came to give life and to give it abundantly, I believe what he was referring to is an abundance of his characteristics. So that is love, peace, joy, gentleness, patience, kindness. We're going to, we're going to experience an abundance of those things, an abundance of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And so it's, it has very little, actually it has nothing to do with money, but it has to do with an abundance of life and 
in life, there is love, there's peace, there's kindness and all those different things. So let's dive into, yeah, let's dive this into this just a little bit, starting with personal responsibility Um, in your program or just kind of in your coaching, how do you encourage people to take personal responsibility for their finances? And I'd like to know, you said you work with pretty affluent clients, but what does that look like when somebody is stuck in a cycle of financial hardships? Yeah, I've, I've definitely coached a lot of people in financial hardships, not, not just people who make a lot of money. Uh, when, when people are in financial hardships, it, it can be really easy to blame everyone else for your life. And I've gone through two separate times where I gave myself malnourishment. I don't know if you know that, Nino. <laughs> no, we have not talked no. about that. No. No. So, so I started losing my hair. I started not being able to remember things. I was so stressed out about money that I uh, was not eating healthy foods consistently. I had stopped taking all of my vitamins and, and unbeknownst to me, I, I have a, a vitamin a malabsorption issue. So, mm. so I need to take just massive amounts of vitamins. And thankfully, my parents just gave me vitamins from the time I was very young. So I didn't have the issue growing up. But once I was on my own, paying all of my own bills, I stopped eating as much food and stopped eating healthy food. And two separate times gave myself malnourishment. (laughs) You'd think I'd learn after the first one. Um, And so I, I could have very easily blamed a lot of people for that. And I think I did early on in my in my life. I blamed my dad for my car loan and and my parents for all of my student loans. I blamed a lot of different people. I blamed the, uh, the economy for the fact that I was in a super low paying job. And it wasn't until I took responsibility for my own life and, and stopped waiting for somebody else to rescue me and started, I, I did. I mean, honest to God, I prayed so hard at this time, because I didn't know what else to do. And God opened some doors, I got a part time job, I ended up getting promoted in my job, I, uh, he somehow showed me, and gave me the skills to negotiate, I learned those. So I ended up increasing my pay in various different ways to pay off bills, pay off loans, and take myself out of malnourishment. So, so it was it was a tough time. And it's really, really easy to blame someone else, but you can't experience financial abundance in your life if you're not taking responsibility for your life. So that's why this is part of it, because your abundance doesn't come from from external sources. It comes Mm. from, I believe anyway, it comes from the Holy Spirit living in you and you being able to put your faith into action. And so to me, faith is nothing if you're not taking steps. It's a, it's belief, but it has nothing to do with, with, you know, b- belief is nothing unless you're working and you're, you're, mm-hmm. you're actually putting your actions to it. So that's, that's where personal responsibility comes in. And I really appreciate that story because in it, you know, first of all, you had to do your part, right? We have to do our part and God will do his part. And in that, your part was even taking a part-time job. It's not as if you started praying and then all of a sudden some huge windfall came and it was, "Ah, well, that was all taken care of. It was, okay, I have to take the steps. And the first step might not have been a very attractive step, a part-time job, but you took the step. I love that story. Thank you for sharing. Let me ask you about value-based spending and aligning your spending with your values? Because you also said that that was an important role in this financial abundance. So how does someone identify their core values and align their spending with those values? It's funny. That's such a hard thing to do, right? To identify Mm -hmm. your core values if you haven't done it before. So if you it's an easy thing and a hard thing to identify your core values because your core values are, are the, the top three or four things that you really treasure in life. For mine, it's 
integrity and authenticity is the first one. The second one is serving God and people. So, so loving people and caring for people by serving them. And the third one, it's funny, all of a sudden there's a camera in my face and I can't remember it. See, this is why it's easy <laughs> and hard and hard. And so, so value-based spending and identifying your core values is all around identifying those values and then looking at your spending and saying, where does it line up and where doesn't it? Mm. Does that Netflix subscription? That was big. <laughs> so it's right there. That, you yeah. okay? Yeah, it's fine. Lights right. are still on. So identifying your core values and aligning your spending is all about really seeing where your spending is and then deciding on a line by line basis is this bringing me joy is this helping fulfill those values and if not what do i need to change that's it in a nutshell yeah i love sharing this uh, personal experience that i had with this i will tell you before about 12 or 18 months ago i didn't i didn't even think about my finances and the line items on my budget through the lens of my values. Um, but my my values are um, very similar and they run very deep. And so they usually just kind of appear. They, the way I handle my money my and I manage my money just kind of happens to align with my values just because they're so strong. But when I started looking at this, there was one subscription. It was costing me $16 a month, so it wasn't breaking the bank. But I started to question it. And as I reflected on it, it was a Xbox Live subscription so that we would have um, access to a bunch of online games as a family. And that was the reason for getting it in the first place. And at first, we did, as a family, we sat down and we played a lot of different games, my son and I the most. But some months had gone by and the kids weren't using it nearly as much, hardly if ever. And all of a sudden I found myself playing a video game that I thought I had left in my past. You know, it, if you're familiar with Grand Theft Auto, it's not the most pleasant game. You know, and it was one of those games that I certainly couldn't play while the family was around. I, I felt convicted enough. I'm not going to play this when my 10-year-old is up. So now I'm up until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning playing this video game and really asking myself, what am I doing? Why am I here? How did I get here? And so I started hearing about aligning your spending to your values. And I started thinking about that specifically. And needless to say, we no longer have an Xbox Live subscription. I no longer play Grand Theft Auto, but it's just a great example of when we look at how we're spending our money and the things that we're spending it on, and we start to align it to our values, it becomes easier to identify the things we want and the things that we no longer want. I, I totally agree. <laughs> we, had a, we had a weird come to Jesus moment with our kids recently about that. Um, I'm sorry to say I am a semi strict mom and, but I let my kids spend their money the way that they want, as long as they save some of it and give some of it away. Right. So build mm -hmm. those, those habits in early. Uh, but they, we, we put them in a different camp for one week. It was this week, actually, we put them in a different camp for this week. And I got an email on Friday last week that said, just so you know, there's going to be an ice cream truck at the camp every day at 12.35 p.m. So I looked up from reading the email, talked to the kids and went, hey, there's gonna be an ice cream truck. We've talked about this. You're not to get anything from the ice cream truck because we're trying to save ice cream for the end of the day. So no ice cream, guys. And they both went, yeah, mom, yeah, mom. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I promise this ties in. On Tuesday, I was going for a walk with the kids and I'd said, okay, if we go around the block four times, that's a mile and a half, then you can have an ice cream sandwich. Like, that's fine. 
I'm just trying to get them to exercise a little bit more. And uh, so for better or worse, judge my parenting. I don't care. And um, <laughs> and uh, and then my daughter goes, well, we already had ice cream today. I was like, excuse me? Excuse me? She said, yeah. So you know, she told me this tale about how she happened to have her wallet on her and then the ice cream truck was there and she spent her money and then gave money to her brother who who actually stole money from her, spent $8 instead of the $3 she told him to spend. And, uh, and so there was all of this stuff going around with money. And I, I will admit, I got a little upset and I said, okay, ice cream's canceled tonight. And we're going around more than four times. And, and also you have to do laps in the backyard. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and after they, they paid their penalty for that, we sat down and we talked about it. And I said, how does spending that money and disobeying me, how does that feel? And they both looked at me and said, it doesn't feel good. We weren't supposed to do it. I said, do you still think it was a good idea? They said, no, no. I said, what part of that is the kind of person you want to be? So for little kid language, so they're eight and six, that's values, right? Mm -hmm. So what part of that is the person you want to be? And they both said, that's not who I want to be. Mom, we're sorry, we're not going to do it again. So like that, that in a nutshell is value-based spending. You look at every mm. behavior and decision. You say, is this who I want to be? And if not, what do I need to do instead? Love that. So for our listeners out there, how does this value-based spending and, and, and managing your money in the way that you just illustrated, how does it impact their long-term financial success? Or more simply put, why? Why should I do this? Joy, Nino. Joy. <laughs> There's so much more joy. Can you imagine if every single thing that you spent money on, you were excited about, hmm. right? You, you knew that it was part of who you were. You weren't just doing what everybody else did just to be like everybody else. You were being you. Hmm. You get so much more joy when you align your spending to your values. And if, if you do it without just checking the box, but you, you do it properly, then joy is the result. That's why. Yeah. So long term, it means that you're a more joyful person. Long term, it means that you're building the life that builds joy with it. Yeah. And if I may, I'm going to go back to the, the example of me playing this video game, right? Some might ask, yeah, but you know, if you're enjoying it, then, you know, what's the big deal? Whether I was enjoying the game is kind of irrelevant to me. Here's what I noticed. I noticed that for a guy who normally ends up in bed about 1030, no later than 11, I was now up until two, three, four o'clock in the morning. I know that for a guy who likes to spend time with his family, I was waiting for my fam for the kids to go to bed and for my wife to fall asleep so that I could play this game. Like this it really threw my values out of whack. And it just it was not that it necessarily had a tremendous uh impact on my mood. But imagine somebody who normally gets eight hours of sleep, getting four hours of sleep. Things are going to happen and mood is going to change. And, and so you're absolutely right. Like here I thought I was, quote, enjoying this video game and some me time or whatever. And I'll tell you what, I don't miss it. I'd much rather spend that time with the family doing other things. Um, even if it's playing a different video game, but doing it with the family instead of without the family just has led to more joy and more peace. Right? Peace was a huge part of that, too. Um, feeling like I was getting behind on work because I was prioritizing playing this silly game. So there's there's a lot to be gained by aligning your spending with your values. 
Yeah, yeah. As you're saying that, I'm realizing we both had examples where we took things away, and it's not about that. It's about mm -hmm. it's it, you take things away so you can add other things. So I've yeah. had people align their values to or their spending to their values, and now they can afford classes that they wanted to take. Now they can afford going out with their family more. Now they can afford a lot of different things that they had just constrained themselves to not afford. Right. One of the things that we replace, because oftentimes when you eliminate one thing, you, you typically replace, but, and this is certainly not like a bragging, like, oh, look at how good we are, because we ain't good. But my wife had been wanting to donate to a couple of nonprofit organizations, specifically like St. Jude's and uh, the alike. And it's one of those things that I was like, oh, we'll get around to it. We'll get around to it. We'll, maybe we'll do like an end of the year contribution, whatever, right? It was eh, right? Like, but the moment we got rid of this $16, it was like, hey, you know what? Let's reallocate those funds to something that does really align with our values. And it's just been a, a great little addition to the budget where it's like, hey, you know what? Now we know some of our funds are going to a place that we respect and we want to help out the little that we can, but it, you're right. It's not about just eliminating things. It's about add things that you really care about. Yeah. And how does that giving feel, Nino? Oh, fantastic. I mean, which is also a great segue because you had also talked about giving as part as being part of the financial abundance. So the question becomes, how does the act of giving contribute to financial abundance? How, do, how are those two things tied together? We've run out of time for today's special episode of the New Money Habits podcast. Be sure to join us again next time when we continue our conversation with our special guest. Remember, if you have questions, you can hit us up on social at New Money Habits. Can't get enough of the show? Ask your smart speaker to play the next episode of the New Money Habits podcast. And please consider leaving a five-star rating and review. They truly help us spread this message of hope to people looking for a better plan for their money.